On this episode of Eager to Know, the advantages of starting small, how relying on your gut can be key, and the role of creativity in your business and life. We all have a creative part of our brain, whether we use it or not, for generating new ideas, problem solving, and just viewing ourselves in this world. I am Ricky McEachran, an artist living in Chicago, and I am eager to know and share with you all how people of a creative leaning have brought this way of thinking to the forefront and how it has shifted outcomes. Greg and Ken are the owners of the Pastoral Family of Businesses, three European-inspired wine and cheese shops, and Bar Pastoral, a cheese and wine bistro. They also supply cheese to over 100 restaurants in Chicago. So many of the best cheese plates that you can find in the city are from them. I spoke to Greg about the business, how they started, and how creativity is involved. So a wine and cheese business, that sounds like a dream business for someone to be in. That sounds like something that someone would think of on a vacation in France. You know what we should do with our lives? We should be in the business of wine and cheese. Did you ever envision that this is what you would be doing with your life? Um, we sort of have uh, meandered our way through our lives with uh, all sorts of opportunities and exposures. And I think that sometimes you become a sum total of all the various opportunities and experiences you've had. And um, so ultimately creating this business was solving a problem um, when we moved to Chicago, something we wanted, a gap that was you know, not filled. But um, having lived in Europe twice, having you know, traveled to 40 countries for business, have a, having a partner who went to culinary school in New York and who loved, you know, w- w- we loved grazing as dinner. And, you know, for us, right. you know, working a lot, uh, long hours coming home and you know hanging out with people from Europe and New York and you know all over the world people who wanted to have a some cheese and some olives and a you know crusty bread and some uh, a bottle of wine and and you know not cook right and uh, so for us it was kind of neat um but it was one of those things that we had our whole other careers first and then we got to a certain point and we realized, oh, I think we may have something. So was this your first small business venture? It was. In fact, um, both Ken and myself uh, both felt uh, that we were, we didn't think we had entrepreneur in us. Um, we were, we both had, uh, you know, he was a software developer for the Navy doing imaging systems for nuclear submarines. And I'm, you know, fresh out of business school doing um, global marketing for CPG firms like Colgate Palmolive. And I was perfectly happy being in the corporate thing. And, and so yeah. that was never the plan. The ne- it wasn't like, oh, we never, were, never, were never the plan um, at gotcha. all. And, and, you know, even up until almost the time that we did it, it was never really the plan. And it certainly wasn't a plan to have multiple stores and all these other businesses, but things happen organically. So was that scary for you to go from a corporate job and where he was working, I think you just said, for the Navy to suddenly starting a small business? Yeah. And after he got done, he, when we first met 26 years ago, he worked for the Navy and did that stuff. And then he went on to the title insurance company. And so we both had corporate jobs. Sure. Um, yeah. Our risk profiles were not well developed okay. um, I to, to put it mildly and we were used to living a certain way and having you know our yes I worked long days but when I was done I was done you were done and uh, I could go off to Cape Cod for the weekend or I could go to Saugatuck or just hang out in town and, and, and do whatever and then starting a business where you have to give yourself permission to be off and you never really are off um, the phone can ring at any time. I think that really made a big difference. And uh, and yet, it, all of the little pieces of our lives have prepared our, for ourselves for this. So you so, felt like everything was sort of, you realized that everything had sort of prepared and led you t- to this somewhat? On some level. I think we never could have imagined that we would have been an Oprah's favorite things three times or on the Today Show or William Sonoma catalog, stuff like that. I mean, that or or a lot of other great opportunities, the Citibank commercial that we're uh, featured in. I mean, that stuff that who knew? I mean, but I think 
we believed in the concept that we had. We started really small. Um, you know, we've made some a bunch of mistakes along the way, and anybody who tells you that they haven't is lying. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that the reality is is that we um, have sort of grooved ourselves into it. There are times when I wish I hadn't done it because it, there are some days when it would have been just so much safer to have just stayed in a corporate environment, sure. wrote it out, yep. built up the uh, 401k instead of draining the 401k, yeah. and um, actually just you know putting you know yourself put your interests in your side stuff rather than in your in your vocation so let's talk about the idea of starting small tell me a little bit about how small did you start and do you think that that is a good strategy or philosophy for people that are starting something new to go that route well you know it's really funny in america everybody wants to you know go big or go home and i've always kind of taken a little exception to that because i don't necessarily think you know some some of our our failures have been when we've gone bigger than we should have um unfortunately andersonville our our space we went way too big um for for the complexity the cost and all that stuff um but we chose to go small because first of all our business is in the hospitality business when you throw a party in your house where does everybody hang out the the kitchen hang out in the kitchen because they like it intimate. They want to rub elbows. So keeping it small, starting it small, is you know you want to be rubbing elbows. When we say small, can you tell me what, what that specifically was? Well, our first store, which is still open, is 388 square feet of selling space in the front of the house with another 250, 300 in the back for you know wash wares and stuff like that. So, and, and was that just retail? That's all you were doing or were you doing? All retail. That's that's our first shop, and that's sort of like some of the little shops, like the first um, Murray's Cheese Shop in in uh, the Village in New York, or mm-hmm. or the um, the famous cheese shop for uh, Fromaggio in uh, South End of Boston, which was not much bigger than that. And I think what we felt was, I'd rather have reason to expand. I'd rather grow out of my space than try to have to grow into my space. Sure. So what are the advantages when starting a new venture of starting small? Well, risk, money, um, the need to um, go a little deeper into, I mean, you get, you have an exit uh, escape hatch if you start small. Um, if you borrow tons and tons of money and then you're beholden to a lot of people, then you're sort of uh, kind of at the point of no return in some ways um, or you have to find a way to pay it back. Um, I think a lot of times if you start it and it's something that isn't labor intensive and you don't have to hire a lot of people, then your own personal um, capital, the own your human capital yep. um, can be uh, one of your biggest investments um, rather than just financial capital. And I think it allows you to be creative in the beginning because when you are smaller like that, you can try things and then that worked, but that didn't, or you can morph. Um, you can kind of uh, be a little bit more creative on the fly. And I also think it allows us to um, then imagine, like, for example, when we first thought we were opening, we were opening a wine and cheese shop. Well, we did market research and we were, you know, we were trying to be very creative with our concept, but we realized that cheese was where it was. And then we had to make sure that we were small enough, but robust enough in what we were doing that we excelled in our niche. So I think developing a niche which implies small, yep. um, but being really good at it is something to grow from. So it sounds like you probably have to be very comfortable with the process of trying something new and failing or it not working out and just moving on to the next thing. If you're so afraid of failure that you just can't possibly imagine and, and if, if your ego is that fragile, don't do it. Um, but most people over imagine their fragility. Um, I think, I think most of us can handle a lot more than we think we can. Um, I really thought that I, oh my God, what if I screw up and sure. you know, we just, you know, we just closed a place months ago and 
Yet we have the rest of our business and we just got some great press about all the rest of our business. And, you know, we're, we soldier on. I, I think, I think everybody has to, you got to roll with the punches. You got to also realize that not every idea you have is going to catch fire. And sometimes one that you didn't think was going to catch fire at all goes way further than you thought it would. Yeah, no, that makes that I can completely relate to that. I think that there's a lot of people that are a little bit stuck and afraid of failure and afraid of trying something new because they're going to fail. And obviously, part of being successful in anything is having a trail of failures behind you of trying trying things that didn't work and some of them did. I mean, in the, in the Chicago, well, well, let's just say Chicago restaurant world, for lack of going broader, um, some of the most successful restaurateurs in the city um, will tell you almost every single one of them has closed one or more you know there, there are tons of people you know people like uh that everybody love alpina singh i mean you know here she is uh, running check please and she's you know the one of the you know most respected master sommeliers and she's opened and closed a number of restaurants in the last couple of years and and um and that doesn't that's that doesn't besmirch her right. uh reputation um it it may be a disappointment there may be things that she wishes she did differently just like what we all do and it's nothing against her it's actually more for her i i think she's not afraid she knows you got to go out there it's not like you're just throwing spaghetti against the wall yep. but you, you are going to have a, a batting average sure and there are very few people that are batting a thousand yep would you say that you use the creative part of your brain in running your business? I would like to say that both Ken and myself, um, we used to always think that we, we were like yin and yang and one was the, you know, one was the more left brain and one was the more right okay. brain. And, and to some degree it's true. Mm -hmm. Um, Ken is, very much the digit head and the systems guy and all that stuff. And I guess I'm the softer side of Sears, but <laughs> both of us, you know, have to um, have balanced skill sets. And, and we also, I think creativity often gets misconstrued in terms of what creativity is. Creative thinking can be applied to every single thing you do. Okay. And, and I think that enough people don't realize that they have creative skills um, that they actually apply in many aspects of what they do. Okay. And a good example is uh, somebody um, talking about how they want to um, build their home or arrange their home or how they're going to, um, you know, uh, design their life. Um, a lot of people, you know, there's this whole concept out there of free agency these days. It's a, uh, it's, it's not a completely new idea, but um, I went to a career coach years back when I was trying to imagine what I would be doing down the road, and she wrote a book called um, Free to Succeed, and, and it was a book about the fact that our grandparents all went to you know one company for 35 years, oh, got yes. the gold watch, mm -hmm. got their retirement, went on some bad <laughs> trip, and probably didn't live much past 70. Um, and what I think we have now is people creatively designing their lives to yes. like, okay, I want to be a painter, but I don't think I want it as a vocation. I want it as an avocation. Well, my grandmother did that. And then all of a sudden it started to explode and then it became a bigger portion of her life. Now she still did her other job that paid the bills and did all that stuff but it's not like she replaced it she she did a percentage shift and she did it over time some people plan that some people it's evolutionary but i think that a creative approach to tapping into all your likes dislikes strengths opportunities all the things that you want to do they don't necessarily have to be sequential um, they can overlap and they don't have to be um, conflicting necessarily either. And so to me, um, that's an area where um, the modern person has um, shown their creativity in balancing all the parts of themselves. Creativity is something that I think as we get busier and we get older, we 
don't give ourselves the luxury of um, pursuing, or we define it in a way that it seems like a frivolous um, endeavor. Yes. And, and something that only when I have this much time, which never seems to ever occur. And I just think that um, creativity can be um, 30 minutes at the beginning of the day, um, writing a journal. Yep. Um, it can be um, looking at uh, things that we're doing and evaluating things. I, I, I feel like some of the most creative parts of my day are the margins of my day. Okay. Um, and so I find that, uh, especially as an entrepreneur, that I, I allow myself to dream more at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night or early in the morning when I'm on the back porch looking out and I've got a cat on my lap. <laughs> um, and I, I feel like don't deny yourself that because it's um it is often not a start and stop all wrapped up in a bow thing but though that is sort of like a, uh, a an ongoing conversation that you start pick up and continue which is actually how we got to pastoral it was many years of thinking about how much we enjoyed certain things that in life you know, having life go on, living life, seeing things, going into a little shop in Verona, Italy, and seeing them fill up bottles with olive oil and saying, ah, so, taking a note. So it was kind of like the, so what you're saying is it was kind of that creative part of your brain that was open to this idea that led to pastoral? I think the creative part of our brains imagined that uh, just because something didn't exist didn't mean it wasn't needed and so nice. but we had to come up with a way that it had a hook um that people could relate to it um and so i think for us you know travel inspires a lot of people sure people come home on such a high after a great vacation where they saw something that they've never seen here and they wonder why they don't have it here mm -hmm. and and it, then it drops yeah and not everybody has to let it drop so, Greg, how important is your gut in making decisions in your business and in your life? Well, a lot of people have uh, talked about how, you know, I'll go with your gut. And early in my life, I thought that was a joke. Um, I, and, and it also sometimes thinks, I think that that sometimes flies in the face of the do your homework, which I've, I've, I'm a big believer in. Um, but also, um, I've learned as life goes on that, emotional intelligence is really um, not to be ignored because um, it is the correlation of experience, judgment, fear, and a confluence of other aspects of yourself that is not necessarily writing out a conclusion on a piece of paper to you, but that feeling of either um, uncomfortable yep. or of go for it um, is usually based in a lot of things that are happening in the back part of your head. Yeah. And, and frankly, I have, when I don't listen to my gut or when I try to tamp it down, it has often come back to bite me. Do you think that's something that gets stronger as you get older and you have more experience behind you? Yeah, I think we, well, I think we probably peak at it in the middle of our lives. Okay. I think we are, are super, super risk seeking early in life. And we tend to get uh, more and more risk averse um, later in life. Okay. Um, depending upon what else is going on in your life, whether you have what your um, responsibilities are to dependents and, and mortgages and things like that, yeah. we will sometimes squelch it. But I do believe that a lot of us know in our heart of hearts what the answer is to some things, but then we uh, talk ourselves out of it. And um, sometimes we also, um, I think you do need to live long enough and experience enough that you have reference points and your head processes that. But then there are people who are just going to always deny themselves and they're going to be always, some people who will always talk themselves into things, whether all their inner signs are saying, no, 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 danger, yeah. Will Robinson, danger. Um, I think you need to, you know, 
someone who is well aware and emotionally intelligent has some is somewhere in the middle there. There's a confluence of judgment um, and also, you know, allowing yourself um, permission. Do you think EQ is something that can be developed, or is it something that you can just um, enable access to inside of yourself? I don't believe that somebody who has zero EQ can develop into off-the-scale EQ. I think you can maximize um, what you have. Uh, I think there are certain people who are already wired for it pretty darn well, and there are some people for whom they have never given themselves or they've never felt that anybody gave them permission to okay. do it. Um, so I don't know. Somebody who spent their whole life in the military and subjugated to being told how things went, and they may have a harder time unraveling to allow themselves an EQ. Yep. On the other hand, they have to make... A, judgment calls and it may be actually happening without them thinking about it sure. but but proactive uh, you know it, it's sort of the the thing is you're not going to ma you make somebody something they completely aren't but you can maximize the potential that someone has and i think that that's something that is never a bad thing so greg could you give our listeners just a couple things a couple tips or pieces of advice on moving things forward in their lives based on your experience in running your businesses and your career thus far. Well, you know, it's really weird. I, I never thought that I would have lived what probably I would equate as three or four separate and distinct lives. And, and I really have, like I could look at a timeline and almost uh, kind of section them off. Um, and they didn't necessarily feel like I was like picking up and moving to Timbuktu and just dropping everything. But to transition or to reimagine or to reinvent or evolve as a person um, is not just to let everything take you along. I don't believe that you should just... Um, only do the things that are handed to you or that just come to you. I sure. think you have to, you know, you can wait for luck or you can make your own luck. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I, my father has kind of ingrained in me and I've always been um, kind of, I take it naturally is, first of all, you got to do your homework. You have got to figure out, um, you know, that what's out there. And also, you know, these people that come in half cocked that like, oh my God, this, wouldn't this be great? Well, you know, you've got people that are experts in the content, but they don't know how to run a business okay. or they are really good at business, but they have no idea about the product that they're selling. Right. You need to be curious. You need to have done homework and you need to care. And you also shouldn't rush. I'm a big believer that people waste a lot of their capital in rushing to do something if they had just taken another six months or thought through it or done more, um, you know, informational interviewing trips, you know, all the things that have inspired the us. The research can be as much of as going on a trip to Vermont um, and meeting with farmers sure. and just seeing what makes them tick. Um, or go work for somebody doing something that you think you want to do and do it for a little while and find out if you actually really like yeah. it. So from my perspective, doing your homework and not rushing. Also, a lot of people really think that they can do things on the cheap and that they can. Um, you should always realize that things run over. They cost more than you ever think they're going to. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to plan for that. Um, and I also think you have to not take life too seriously. I think at the end of the day, you know, we have our governing principles in our business. And the last one of those is um, not taking life too se uh, seriously. It's just cheese. <laughs> and, you know, we're not coming up with a recipe for world peace or, yeah. or solving a brain cancer or something like that, unfortunately, uh, although hopefully we're, we're creating some happiness. But I think a sense of perspective and keeping some joy in what you're doing. And yes. I really feel creativity and joy are, you know, if you're, if you're walking around with a frown all day long and you're making a lot of money, I, I, good but i mean 
you got to live that life every day. Yeah. So my evolutions have usually had a component of business, but also personal fulfillment. And I think having a real sense of self and um, what you know you're good at. I always tell people um, it's sort of like uh, doing a grid. Write down all the things you're good at, the things you're not really good at, and then the things you like and then the things you don't like. And then put in, kind of put the likes and good ats together and then find the happy place. Nice. Usually what pays the bills for a lot of people, though, <laughs> is what they're good at and they don't like. Right. But then you can come up with a plan to migrate from that that which pays the bills that you don't love and maybe a part of that's always going to be there yeah but kind of trying to define a destination rather than just meandering you know they say not all who wander are lost but just wandering your whole life may be foregoing a lot of great opportunities and so i think being a little proactive um even if you take a little extra time to do it is a good thing and that four by four that two by two grid that's, that's yeah, the two by two grid. It's um, it's the equivalent. You know, a lot of the business schools and stuff will do the SWOT analysis, right? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, yep. threats. This is more of a personal SWOT analysis. I like that. And I think it what it does is it forces you to be introspective, and you're not just writing down things like I'm really good at numbers and I like to uh, accounting. Right. Sometimes it's I don't like mornings. Right. Like that should be on there. Right. Or I'm really good at multitasking. Like and some of those are traits. And and I think I'm really good at listening. Exactly. Things so what like I'm that. saying is yeah. that it's not just hard skills that would be on a resume. It's actually putting in the things that make you happy, the things that don't make you happy. Like for example, we might be great at running a coffee place or a bakery. I do not want to be up at three o'clock in the the morning morning. getting up when it's dark out. Yep. That would have going through that process and, and maybe putting some of those things in bold versus things that are lesser importance. Those help steer you. Yep. So if people wanted to learn more about your businesses, where can they find that information? Well, thank you for asking. Um, Our website is a great place to start, um, pastoralartisan.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R-A-L-A-R-T-I-S-A-N.com. I I spell that because everybody spells it artesian sometimes, so I really always like to be clear. Um, And also, if you want to know what's going on with our businesses, the more fluid stuff, um, follow us on Instagram, um, you know, Pastoral Chicago or uh, Pastoral Artisan, our uh, Facebook presence, um, and the same with Bar Pastoral. Um, We're we're on there. Um, That tells you all the fun stuff we're doing because we do a lot of cool stuff in the winter times. It's a long, cold winter in Chicago, so we do our classes and our, our raclette dinners and all sorts of fun stuff. Greg, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I think this was an excellent conversation. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. My name is Ricky McGuckrin, and you have been listening to Eager to Know, the podcast. If you haven't already, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join me next week for another Eager to Know podcast. 